Hello, this is the Part-Time Economist, and today we are continuing with Chapter 6 of Richard Daft's book, The Leadership Experience. Now, in Chapter 6, we're going to be looking at courage and moral leadership. So, what is an ethical leader? Um, I'm sure we all know what ethics is, and Daft defines a leader, but he specifically mentioned four traits that I wanted to highlight. The first of these is humility. The leader should be humble. Now, this doesn't mean that he can't be proud of what he's accomplished or confident. No, humility means that he's not rubbing this in. He's not doing everything for a self-serving glory. So he's leading his team to some common objective because they have a shared goal. He's not doing it for personal glory. He's willing to sacrifice. Now, honest. Honest goes without saying, you know. How many business executives, coaches, presidents, senators have been prosecuted for being dishonest, for lying, for cheating, for stealing? You know, if you want to have a successful career, you got to build on a solid foundation. So being honest is one of the key requirements. Now, a leader is also responsible. He's responsible to his subordinates, right? He's responsible for taking care of them, ensuring they have good working conditions, fair treatment. But he's also responsible to the company, to his superiors, for providing them what they need to do their job, for providing a certain product or piece of information that helps them make their decisions. And lastly, the leader should be encouraging. The leader should be encouraging his teammates to work harder, to develop. He, he's, he's like a coach. He can't be demeaning. You know, people don't really work that well when you constantly belittle them. It's much better to encourage them, to build them up, and help them develop in their studies, their profession, whatever. Now, something that I specifically wanted to talk about was Kohlberg's morality model. Now, this is a very interesting model, and I'd actually looked at it a little bit before this class that I'm taking. But essentially, there are three stages of morality. There is pre-conventional, and in this stage of morality, someone will follow the rules, but they're only doing it out of narrow self-interest. For example, someone exhibiting pre-conventional morality would not rob a store, not because they don't want to hurt people, but because the cops could come and arrest them, right? They're not, they don't have any duty to society, their only duty is to themselves. If there's a law that they could break and get away with it, they would do it. The only reason they don't is because of that fear of punishment, right? So that's pre-conventional morality. As we move up to conventional morality, we still essentially follow the rules, but we follow the rules of the larger social system. So if there's a specific law or a policy that says, something is good, right? We can do this, it's allowed, it's permissive, but the norms of society, the norms say that it's bad. We're still not going to follow this. We're not going to do this even though we're technically allowed to because it goes against societal norms. But the flip side is also true. Let's say there's something that is outlawed, right? Let's say, for example, cheating on a test, right? We know we're not supposed to cheat on a test. We have these academic integrity statements we have to sign. Someone exhibiting conventional morality, let's say that they took the test and their buddy was taking it the next day. And for whatever reason, they got their copy of the test back. They would try to help their buddy, giving him old copies of the test, telling him what the essay questions were, because the societal norm is that we help our friends on tests. Even though it's technically prohibited, we still, we're not following the specific law, we're following the larger norms of society. Now, as we move to post-conventional morality, this is something that only about 20% of the population attains. Post-conventional morality is when we follow universal principles that are independent of society or even laws themselves. We base our decisions on universal ethics and principles. So, um, post-conventional morality would be someone like perhaps, perhaps a Martin Luther King, right? Because the segregation that he was facing, one, it was law, right? So if he was pre-conventional, he would have followed and said, well, that's the law, I don't want to get in trouble. If he was conventional morality, he would have looked at society as a whole and said, 
Well, society seems to support this, but he was exhibiting post-conventional morality because he said, even though society accepts these things, it's not universally right. So I'm going to take a stand against this. Moving on, we also see a different type of leadership focus. Now, DAF defines four different types of leadership focus, starting with more focus on the leader and then moving to more focus on the subordinate. Now, the first leadership focus is on the leader. This is stage one where the leader is controlling all of his subordinates. You have an authoritarian leader and he has obedience of followers. He says something, they do it. Now, this doesn't mean he's bad or mean or anything like that. It just means that he's very directing, telling them what needs to be done with little input, right? And I know this is kind of abstract, so I like to give examples. Simple, something like this would be kind of like the military, right? Where you have a sergeant and he tells a private, hey, you're going to go clean the motor pool. You're going to go sweep the floor. There's, there's really no discussion. The subordinate's just supposed to go do it, right? Because, again, this leadership focus depends on the situation, right? There's really nothing to discuss about sweeping the floor, cleaning the motor pool. It needs to get done, so you're going to do it. Now, as we move up to stage two, which is participation, we have a participative manager or a leader. This person kind of he gives what needs to be done, and he tells the way to do it. And the, the subordinates can submit input. They're, they're going to have, like, sensing sessions. They're going to have, you know, group meetings. And the subordinates are expected to offer input that the leader will consider, but it's still the leader's decision. And the way I like to think about this is kind of like a sports team, right? The coach will say, hey, we're going to run a passing play, right? So he gives specific instructions, and then even within the passing play, you know, one receiver runs one way, the running back goes a certain way, but it's still up to the quarterback to decide which receiver he wants to throw to or whether he wants to hand the ball off, right? The players can give input, but at the end of the day, the coach puts a plan into motion, and they execute it with, with reasonable amount of independence. Now, as we move up to stage three, we're focusing on empowering. So we're not just letting our subordinates participate, but we're actually empowering them to make meaningful decisions. At this stage, we have a shared responsibility for defining goals and where we're taking the organization. This is called a stewardship leader. Now, the steward leader sees himself as kind of like a guardian of the profession, if you will, right? He's trying to guide his subordinates, but he's giving them wide, wide leeway in how they're going to accomplish their mission. Um, something like this would be a CEO or, or some high-level position delegating a task to another high-level employee. So this could be the general talking to the colonels that work underneath him. They're both very high-ranking officers. They both have a lot of experience. And the general's telling them, you know, this is what I want done. I'm giving you broad leeway as to how you want to accomplish it. And also, the steward leader isn't so much micromanaging his subordinates as he is coordinating, facilitating, supporting. Hey, if there's anything else that you need me to get you, if there's a answer that you need a question to, if you need external coordination with some other agency, that's what I'm going to do. Now, Daft takes it one step further and says that there is service-based leadership, and this is where, honestly, the first three, I think, are the more mainstream. The service-based leadership is kind of extending things a lot farther than they've ever really been extended before, but the servant-based leadership sees himself as a servant not only to his employees but to the company, the organization. So he's he's working for the company, but he's not working for a paycheck. He's working because he believes in the mission, because he believes in where the organization is going. His goal isn't so much making a profit as it is 
seeing the goals of the organization come to fruition and developing his subordinates. Now, something like this could make sense in perhaps a nonprofit setting, right? Maybe a religious order, maybe a charity, something like that where the goal isn't to make a profit. The goal is either personal development or the goal is to accomplish some objective, right? Now, as we move on in the chapter, we have some other terms that I wanted to define. First off, how do we find courage, right? We want to be a moral leader, we want to be an ethical leader, but how do we do this? One, when we have to do a difficult decision, we need to rely on the strength of others, right? So maybe we have a good friend, a coworker, and it doesn't even have to be in the work environment. We need to find someone that can support us in making these tough decisions and standing up for what's right. Now, we also need to have a higher purpose. For some people, this could be religion, it could be you know God, it could be something like this. But for other people, it's the higher purpose of the organization. So if we see a coworker stealing or cooking the books or something like this, our higher purpose may be a sense of integrity, you know, morality, but it could also be the purpose of the organization, right? Our organization won't be able to accomplish its goals if this behavior is allowed to continue. And then lastly, we can channel our negative emotions. This means turning frustration, this means turning anger and disappointment into something positive. So instead of thinking about how disappointed I am, I can say, you know what, I don't want to feel like this in the future, so this is what I'm going to do better. I'm going to try something different so I don't have these negative emotions. That's about it for this chapter. I hope it's been useful and we'll see you next time as we continue.